view. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, good to be back here again. So uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to join uh, my good colleague, Logan, and talk a little bit about top dressing and surface maintenance uh, for uh, racetracks. So first of all, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, the definition of top dressing. So this is a, a uniform thin layer of soil or finely granulated organic material applied over the turf surface. So this can, we'll talk about a couple different materials that we can use as we go along here, uh, but just wanna kind of set the stage here. Or, you know, if we're talking about top dressing, this could be a verb as well, and, the, and kind of the act of adding that soil or root stone material over the turf surface here. So you can see, uh, I think a lot of people are familiar with this. This is a, a toe behind top dresser here. Uh, in this case, they happen to be applying compost on top of the turf grass surface. So let's talk a little bit about some reasons for top dressing up. Looks like that right side of the, of the slide cut off just, just maybe a little bit there. But um, uh, basically, our, our, one of our primary reasons for doing this is to try to reduce thatch and the, the effects of thatch. Now, of course, with thatch, we, we want to have a little bit of thatch because that's what uh, provides a cushion uh, under foot or under hoof, if you, as you will, um, on, that, on that turf grass surface. So we're thinking about the thatch layer here. This is going to be the, the layer of intermingled stems and roots that are in various states of decay that occur between the verdure or the green part of the turf grass and the actual soil underneath. So this is what we're kind of talking about with this thatch and, and mat layer. So the mat's going to be a little bit more decomposed layer uh, beneath the thatch per se. But right here, you kind of see in this bracket, uh, this would be referred to as that thatch mat layer. So with top dressing, one thing, one of the, one of the big things that we can do with this um, uh, is to try to really dilute that that thatch layer. We're not we're not removing the thatch like we would with an aerification or some other cultivation pro process, but with top dressing, we're actually diluting that thatch um, and then diluting the the effects of that thatch. So another reason we might top dress is to uh, uh, in conjunction with cultivation, as we try to reduce uh, hard compacted soils, reduce the hardness of those soils. Um, so we might go back through, we've talked about it in, uh, a little bit previously today uh, within the panel discussion. Um, and, and Mike had, had talked about that a bit too. Uh, you know, we, if we're trying to, try to you know, fill back holes with sand um, or in some cases compost, we're trying to go back through and, and fill those holes in. And so this is a reason that we might do this to, to try to do this in conjunction with cultivation as was discussed uh, in the panel and by Mike previously. So if we look at this, we have the ability to over time uh, improve the, the soil profile, improve the physical properties of that soil um, via airification and consistent application of that top dressing over time. A couple other uh, reasons here, uh, and this kind of ties in with what we've been talking about, which is where we're trying to improve the aeration and drainage. Um, uh, so with, with adding sand over time, um, you know, we can try to build up that sand layer um, and, and, and try to improve that aeration and drainage uh, by doing that. And obviously, with looking at that, uh, there's more aggressive ways of doing that with, with actually going in and, and doing drainage and, and putting, you know, aggressively building up a sand cap layer, but we can also do that over a more gradual uh, time period as well. So, but with the ultimate goal of improving that aeration uh, and drainage, uh, in some cases we can level out some minor depressions uh, with, our, with our top dressing choices. And then, of course, if we're overseeding, uh, we can use that top dressing as a, as a covering to help to protect the seeds and to retain moisture at that seed bed. So a couple different reasons for top dressing uh, as we look at, at turf management um, overall there. And then the last one I wanted to mention there uh, would be winter protection for crowns. Um, uh, probably not 
not as much used uh, in the uh, you know, horse racing industry. We do that more with uh, with golf course turf, uh, you know, putting greens, uh, things that are more shortly mowed. But uh, that's that's one benefit of of uh, of top dressing as well. So one of the things that we want to think about in selecting our top dressing and, and thinking about our goals for top dressing is uh, are the are the root zone physical characteristics. Um, so what's the texture of the root zone? Uh, so this is, you know, do you have sand? Do you have, uh, do you have clay? Do you have something in between like a loam? Uh, you know, do you have some uh, combination? Uh, you know, what is your combination of sand, silt um, and clay and how is that how is that uh, kind of mixing to, to react in, in the way that your soil reacts? Um, so the thing to think about is, you know, what top dressing material might I use to, to match that existing root zone? So uh, we either want to do that or we want to use a, a more coarse top dressing uh, over a finer textured soil. Um, and then another question that you want to ask is, am I trying to alter the existing root zone? So this would be a case where Maybe I am trying to build up that sand layer over time. Um, and so I'm going with sand instead of uh, uh, a type of top dressing that has a texture that would match the existing root zone. So when we think about root zone physical characteristics, uh, we think about things like texture. So again, this is the, uh, the mixture of sand, silt, and clay uh, underneath that uh, you know, in that soil medium, we think about structure and structure is really how those particles are oriented. So we might have a heavier soil texture, but if those particles are, are, have good structure, uh, then you're able to allow a good, good, better drainage, uh, in that particular uh, scenario. So, uh, the heavier your soil is, the more important the structure of those soil particles is. Uh, another thing that we look at for root zone physical characteristics would be bulk density. So this looks at uh, the uh, amount, the mass of soil per given unit area. So if we have a, uh, a, a denser, uh, pardon me, a, a heavier soil, we're gonna have more density there. And certainly under compaction, we can have a higher bulk density. On the opposite end of that would be uh, sand where uh, we're probably going to have a lot more uh, macropores, a lot more mesopores in that soil. And so we're going to have a lower bulk density, but that's going to, uh, that's one of our important root zone physical characteristics. Porosity refers to uh, the air content of that soil. Uh, so obviously sands are going to have a higher porosity. And then we also look at saturated hydraulic conductivity. How well does that soil uh, move water down through the profile in a saturated state. Um, so this, all of these can give a good, um, a good uh, example of, or pardon me, good, good parameters for assessing root zone physical characteristics. Logan, if you want to chime in here um, as we go along. Oh, you're good. Everything, everything's good. It's, uh, you know, it's just important that before this process is really started, that the, the beforehand work is done to know exactly what we're trying to do, uh, profile-wise or or you know what whatever we're working it towards. We've thought about uh, before selecting this top dressing. Right, exactly. So some of the more common um, top dressing materials that uh, you'll probably use. Include sand, uh, probably one of the most common. So with the sand, we're, we're looking for um, not just any sand, but, but sand that uh, typically has a little bit more of a medium to a coarser texture, uh, a sand that has a good grading to it. That means that you're gonna have different, uh, you know, different size particles that you're gonna have, um, you know, uh, uh, kind of an angular or sub-angular uh, shape to it um, and not, not so much rounded sand, but more of a subangular or angular shape to it. Um, and then with that good grading. So um, uh, you might choose to go with compost. So compost uh, is, is beneficial in that it has good 
nutrient holding capacity. Uh, it also um, has good water holding capacity, but it also allows for better structure in the soil uh, over time to develop. Um, so that's one benefit of, of using compost. Or if you've got um, a, a native soil mix and you're going through, um, you might go in with something like a 60, 20, 20 mix uh, with topsoil with peat and, and sand kind of mixed in there. Topsoil being 60, uh, peat being 20, and then, and then the sand being 20. Um, or again, another mix, some type of mix that matches the current soil profile that you have. Now, uh, Mike Bookholder referred to this last time and I'll iterate it and it's so, so important is once you decide on a material, don't switch materials. Uh, because one of the, the big things that you can get into by switching is, is layering, where you have uh, a real uh, situation where you don't move water into the soil as well as you would uh, as it hits the layers, it's gonna slow down and, and typically we want to go with um, a soil mix that's, that's at least as coarse as a current mix, if not coarser. Um, so, uh, you know, go coarse over fine and don't switch materials um, and don't, you know, once you select the material, uh, that's, that's uh, really important. A little bit of photo from uh, the golf world here. So photo credit to the USGA, but uh, this shows a, a golf putting green and some of the issues you can get into with layering. So you can see here, uh, you know, different top dressing sands, um, um, you know, different, different top dressing materials used in the profile. And, and really you're, uh, you know, you're curbing the infiltration of your water. You're, you're really reducing that amount of, of infiltration that can occur through that layer. So they kind of slough uh, this lower layer off and you look at, okay, here's the roots. So uh, all those roots are kind of bunched up towards the top there because that's where all the water is. And, and then obviously with holding a lot of water in that upper uh, profile, you're running into a lot of other problems as well with increased chance of compaction um, and, and decreased oxygen within that root zone. So, um, you know, layering can be a very, uh, a ver very bad thing to get into. So choose a material and, and stick with it. Um, so um, with, with uh, soil, you know, we can remove like, uh, um, like Leaf was mentioning, we can also, um, you know, drag those existing airification plugs into place. Uh, we can use sand with organic matter. Usually this is somewhere between a 95.5 and an 80.20. Uh, we could use compost, um, but again, don't switch materials. A um, couple uh, just notes on selecting sands. Uh, we look at uh, quartz sand or quartz feldspar sand is going to be more resistant to weathering over time. We know that uh, sands that have a high calcareous uh, content uh, can actually break down in acid conditions. So as you're adding, um, you know, depending on the pH of your irrigation water, uh, depending upon uh, you know, your fertilizers, typically our fertilizers tend to be more acidic. These calcareous sands can actually uh, break down, uh, react with the acid from, um, you know, from those, those acidic sources and actually kind of uh, form a layer that really decreases the hydraulic conductivity of that soil over time. So you want to be cognizant of that. Um, medium to coarse uh, textured sands, uh, but we don't want to go so coarse that we're getting into gravel, obviously. So again, having a good grading, a good uh, distribution, um, and skewing a little bit more towards a medium and coarse is what we're trying to look for for selecting sands for top dressing. So thinking about selecting the amounts of top uh, the amount that you'll need for top dressing, there's various charts out there, and, and you can do the math. Um, but here's a quick chart that I found, you know, kind of looking at, okay, if we're, we're looking at an eighth of an inch uh, depth, uh, we're going to need about 0.4 cubic yards per thousand square feet. Of course, we're probably going to go at, at a higher uh, depth than that for, uh, for racing track. So once we get into, you know, there's three fourths, you're looking at 2.3 cubic yards per thousand square feet. So just being able to kind of 
Uh, think about a budget. Think about, um, you know, think about, um, you know, how much material I'm going to need is, is an important part of planning top dressing. So if we think about some of our logistics for this, um, really, you know, developing a long range plan. Is this regular top dressing a, a practice that you have the, the labor and the financial budget to really commit to, you know, based upon the acreage that you have? And then after thinking about that long range plan, think about your annual plan. Well, you know, uh, again, what, how am I managing my labor and materials budgets on a, on a season by season basis and then on an annual basis, do I have time to, to really do this? Um, and the big thing is, can you work around the race schedule? Um, so, and, and if you can work, well, if you can work around the race schedule, when can you work around the race schedule? So being able to, to really schedule your top dressing and, and try to pencil this in, um, and also come up with alternatives for, you know, if the weather's bad, et cetera, uh, it's going to be an important consideration of some of the logistics of top dressing. Um, so, uh, you know, you can go through and, and if you've got different lanes, you can kind of piecemeal cultivate by lanes, but you certainly don't want to make a habit of piecemeal top dressing by lane because you'll have different levels of buildup in each lane. So you wanna be able to, to apply top dressing to the whole uh, entire course. And then think about too, you know, what are your irrigation capability and resources? You know, how can you, how well you can manage moisture also has an impact on some of your top dressing decisions. Um, you know, can I, can I go out with a heavier top dressing and try to get this watered in, um, you know, uh, you know, things like that, your, your irrigation kind of plays into um, if you can do that. So with top dressing timing, obviously race schedule considerations are, are very important. Uh, we want there to be good growing conditions so that that turf um, is able to, to keep growing and, and have that top dressing kind of work in to the canopy. Um, ideally, we would do this in conjunction with cultivation um, so I know some people who would go through and top dress after cultivation, some people go through and top dress prior to cultivation and then go through and, and airify after that. Um, so you can do that either way. Um, but, you know, being able to think about, um, you know, getting out there, uh, one to three times per year, um, is, is, uh, something we think, want to think about with top dressing time. Um, Logan, you want to talk a little bit about uh, some of your experience uh, up there in Harford County? Yeah, so here's just kind of a, a breakdown of, of some potential ways to, uh, you know, go about top dressing. The, this is an example here of a, of a golf course in the area that top dresses their fairways. Um, I'm not fortunate enough to be able to do that, but they are. And what they use is, is picture here, this Dakota P440. Um, it takes, I believe it can have like 4.2 cubic yards of material in each load. So what this gentleman does is he, he top dresses 32 acres. That's his fairways. Um, plus he does a, another area as well, but the fairways is a big area. And he puts an average of this, you know, two and three quarter to three tons per acre of material down. And he's just using straight sand. Um, you know, not the highest of quality, but not the poorest of quality e either. You know, it has a good distribution like Jeff has talked about. And, uh, you know, a price here, just so you know, like, is this even feasible? For him, it's about $4,500 per application um, to get that done. Now he wants to do that twice a year, uh, you know, if, if he can, or, or add a third lighter one in there. The... Uh, you know, one thing to add here that he's also done and that, that I do at my place, whenever there is cultivation, that's the perfect time to do top dressing, but also to add other, you know, amendments to the soil. So the top dressing doesn't just have to be sand. It could be, you know, carp, like some carbon sources for the biology. It could be, um, uh, you know, lime, great opportunity to apply lime when you have open holes do that top dressing. Um, you know, these can be mixed 
Uh, if you're fortunate enough to have a nice, uh, you know, sand source and um, quarry or whatever next to you, and they can blend things for you, it's a great opportunity to do multiple things at once. You can make the biggest change to the soil, you know, when it's opened up after airification with top dressing, um, you know, and, and definitely as Jeff just mentioned, the, the, if you have native soils, incorporating this top sand is key. Otherwise you get the layering, you'll end up drying out on the top, that's potential, um, you know, and then you have two different, two different, you know, texture surfaces, uh, which obviously in the equine side is, is not good. We're looking for consistency. So, um, air, you know, top dressing is very important doing the groundwork, uh, but it, it is feasible. This takes this for 32 acres. It takes him one guy takes pretty much eight hours. He says two guys. It's it's less because he's able to run uh, you know sand around faster with tractors rather than driving all the way back. But if you think about it strategically, if you can store some sand piles, uh, you know, so you're not going all the way back to one place, uh, you can make it a little more feasible. So uh, this kind of leads us into, into divot mix. And um, with that, we'll kind of wrap up our time and, and hand it over to uh, Jim Prendergast and, and Dr. Trey Rogers talking about divot mixes and other considerations with that. So just wanted to, um, oops, uh, just want to mention real quick, uh, sand cap system. Uh, Dr. Rogers has done a lot of work on this up at Michigan State. So uh, I think he alluded to it just, just briefly here with some of the, the Keeneland renovations. Um, um, you know, this is an idea to kind of combine the advantages of a sand-based system with, with minimizing interruption where the drainage is installed and then the sand top dressing is, is pretty aggressively done to try to build up that sand layer. Um, so this is kind of a whole nother talk in and of itself, but there are, uh, uh, you know, there are techniques for going about this and, and kind of building up that sand cap. So again, I'd just like to say thank you. Uh, thank you for having us. Uh, there you can see our, our contact information there. And um, you know, we're happy to take any questions in the chat. Um, but thank you again. This is Karen, and this is her land. She's been here a long time, along with Mojo. The first fence post went up here. Now there's 5,000 of them. After the storm, she started the cleanup here. And when she needs some peace and quiet, she always finds it right here. This is more than just land, it's home. Karen runs with us on a John Deere 3E Series tractor because who says a day's work has to take all day? Nothing runs like a deer. Search John Deere 3E Series for more. a teenager and in high school and middle school is not easy for girls these days and they get to come here spend time working around the farm spend time with the animals and not feel that pressure until we go to horse shows the first time I saw this land I was about 12 years old I came here with an old mentor I fell in love with it as a little girl and I said I was gonna own it one day my mother, when I was four years old, put me on a little pony walking around the zoo. That was it for me. I love at first sight. Like any kid, when I was younger, I wanted to compete more in the Olympics and go Grand Prix and do things like that. But I put that all on the side and realized I had a different agenda in life. I've taught about 800 kids in this area. A typical day starts early in the morning with feeding the horses. Then usually we clean stalls. This is a daily chore, sometimes twice a day. I'm always on the tractor, mowing, spreading things around, you name it. This is a John Deere 3025P. I love my tractor, I couldn't live without it. I like to just relax and be left alone. I call it my husband. He's very reliable and it doesn't argue. <laughs> it's so easy to use. My 68 year old mother has never driven anything like this before and she was scared to death of it. And once she did, she loves it. She drives it all the time for me and helps me out around the farm. 
Being here in Florida, we deal with a lot of hurricanes, so it can be very stressful when we're in the path of one. That John Deere helps me so much. We go around picking up debris, moving, pushing things with the bucket. I always have an average of 50 students, so whenever there's a disaster that comes around, they're always here and they're ready to work. I call all my girls my kids. They're, they're like part of my family, and they get scholarships for riding, and so we try to keep our sport here a little bit serious but fun. We go to the horse shows. It's great for them. Good, very nice. It teaches them a lot of sportsmanship, how to be more in charge and have more self-confidence. A little stronger on that. There. The parents tell me all the time, you are such a huge influence in our child's life. I love to share my experience with these girls and be able to steer them in a better path. Everybody always asks me, how do you keep doing this? I say, just the sheer passion of it. What am I going to do? Get a condo on the beach somewhere? I'm happier here. I'm Karen Nice, and this is my land.